today I'm going to be conducting a slightly different fireside chat. It won't be the traditional sort where I'm sitting down with guests and doing uh, a formal interview. This is going to be much more of a discussion. Uh, to give you some perspective, we are at the home of Peter Fisk in beautiful, sunny, warm Palm Springs, California. It's Sunday, March the 19th, 2017. My guests today are Billy Lane and, of course, Peter Fisk. We're going to be discussing the issues regarding FTMs in the gay male community. So I'll start off, Billy, and ask you, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, what was happening in the leather community to draw the fight for inclusion for FTMs in the gay male play spaces? Um, well, what happened in the late 80s and early 90s is there was a small handful of people that had been uh, living and playing within the women's leather dyke community in San Francisco, and I was part of a small group of people that began transition to living as men. And um, as, as we transitioned, we were still players, and so the idea, and apparently the conversation was happening, I first became aware of the conversation in 92, but there were men in the community who were like, okay, these were people that were players in the women's community, and now they're men, where do they belong? And so that's where it all started. There was a small group of us, um, most of us who were still around and still playing, um, that didn't really belong in the women's community anymore. And uh, there were some men that wanted to include us in the in gay male uh, play spaces. So that's uh, that's how it all really really started. Was a small group of players that were moving from one part of our our community to another. Talk us through that a little bit. How was this playing out? Um, well, I can tell how you how it played out for me personally, um, because uh, in 1992 I began my physical transition from female to male. But I also left San Francisco, so I started my transition, and then I moved to Seattle. So um, the way that it was playing out nationally was that um, the premier event in 1992 was Inferno. Uh, that, was, that was the premier event for the players in, in the men's community. And there were, there were men that were going to Inferno, uh, men like Tony de Blas and Joseph Bean and Guy Baldwin, who were starting to have discussions about having people that had formerly belonged in the Leather Dyke community um, at, at Inferno. And so how it played out for me personally was that I was in Chicago in 1992 in the company of Guy Baldwin and Joseph Bean, and they were talking about bringing me to the Hellfire Club that weekend. And I, I literally had just started my transition. I mean, Peter knew me back I then. I was very, very male in my appearance already and in my transition into, the, into you know, being a man was, was very smooth. And so I was, I was very new to this, but obviously from that, from that evening and the two of them talking, this, had been, this conversation had been happening at least among a few of them for a while, and uh, they didn't take me to the Hellfire Club that night. I don't know exactly why they decided against that, um, but uh, that's when I first became aware that there was this, this, this idea that uh, FTN should be included in these, in these spaces. And people like me who had a reputation and and skills that were, you know, obviously translatable, whether you were playing with women or playing with men. So that's that's how I first became aware that it was going on. And it was a it was obvious to me in that evening that there had been discussions about this already. Like I, I wasn't the only one that they were talking about, and I certainly wasn't. Um, I mean, I may have been amongst some of the first because I still know a lot of the folks that were going through transition at the time. Um, and there was more than one of us. Oh, yeah. There was there were several of us, and Peter was still in San Francisco at the time, so he may have known a little bit more about what was happening in San Francisco. But this was playing out on a national stage because uh, Hellfire Club, of course, is an international organization with members from all over the world. And like I said, in 92, <coughs> it was certainly the premier play event. Without doubt. And uh, uh, I, I know within that time frame, uh, 
that there were uh, uh, men uh, who had transitioned who were coming to 15 parties, although there was no policy. Yeah. Even in even in the early and mid 90s, I brought some of them. Yeah, yeah, and I, I had already, by the time I started my transition, I'd already moved to Seattle, so for me it wasn't really an issue of, of the 15, although I'm sure that so me, Peter, and I were friends at that time, and I was certainly friends with other guys that were members of the 15, and, you know, I, I, I prob probably would have gone, but... Uh, um, there were no rules. It was if you fit, you came. Yep, yep. There was, there was nothing, but there was, there was a conversation that was happening, like I said, at, at a national level. That's what I knew about it back in 92. What details of these conversations can you share with us? What do you, what do you know about what was being said? Uh, you know, I mean, all, all I can share with you is what was, it, in 92 was that one conversation when I was at, I was at uh, Living in Leather in Chicago, and I was, like I said, I was with Guy, and Joe Bean was there, and they were talking about bringing me to, uh, to the clubhouse um, for play. And... Uh, <coughs> I don't really recall. I mean, it was a long time ago. I was I was quite young. I was um, I'd know jo I'd known Joe Bean since '88 when I moved to San Francisco. So I knew Joe fairly well, and um, I didn't know Guy that well at all. And I was um, I, I was uh, I wouldn't say I was intimidated, but I was definitely um, I was kind of like. I bas basically felt like I was sitting there listening to two people talking about something that, it, that involved me, but I wasn't part of the conversation. It was a discussion they were having about whether or not it was appropriate to take me to the clubhouse. Wow. You know, and, and beyond, beyond that, I don't really recall any details. And then you really moved to 97 before anything basically happened, right? Yeah, well, yeah, 96, 97, yeah. something like that. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what, what else was going on. Because um, I was, when I moved to Seattle, I kind of, you know, I, I, I started doing this internal process and, and I was involved with the community in Seattle, but I wasn't really involved uh, um, much with, uh, with what else was going on. So that's really all I remember about that time, but I do recall that it, it was a conversation and it was definitely one of those conversations where you could tell that, that there were men gay men in the community that were players that were having this conversation. And I knew a lot of the guys in San Francisco yeah. that had gone through transition, and they were definitely players, and I didn't belong in the women's community anymore. Yeah. And, you know, where were we going to go to play at that level? You know, at, at a high level. When did it, when did this issue, and how did this issue, start becoming more personal to you? So, um... So as I mentioned, uh, I, I moved, uh, I lived in San Francisco in the, in the late 80s and early 90s and had the, the good fortune to meet uh, some really incredible members of our community. P Peter and I became friends then. Um, I became uh, uh, friendly with, uh, with Joe Bean and Tony de Blas. And uh, you know, so these are people that I was friendly with and, uh, and, I, was, and I was involved in the community um, at events. And you know, so I was fairly well known. And um, Tony lived in Portland at the time, and I lived in Seattle. And we would get together from time to time. And he approached me in in '96 about um, his his idea was that uh, the reason why there was this pushback from the gay <coughs> male community about including FTMs is that they really didn't know what an FTM was. Um, and and a lot, of, a lot of people at the time, when they transitioned, not specifically within the leather community, but in general, a lot of people would transition from living as one gender to living to an, as another and just kind of like blending in. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's easier, um, I think, that most people that, that have, you know, have some exposure to male to female and female to male, female to male. testosterone is a powerful uh, uh, powerful uh, hormone and you know you get hair and you start to look male and you can kind of like float into your world so Tony's idea was that once introduced once Chicago Hellfire M Club members were introduced to an FTM by God they would understand it and they would open the doors and FTMs would be allowed to come to Inferno 
And uh, so he asked me, it's like, hey, will you come to IML with me? And uh, I want to introduce you uh, to some guys in the club and, and tell them that you're FTM and that I want to bring you to Inferno. Will you do that? And, you know, I'm said, sure. I said, that sounds great. And uh, I think that Tony and I were kind of like-minded at the idea. And we, we had this idea that... The clueless the, the, how it would go down. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we really thought that these are, like, intelligent people. And once they understand the concept, of course they're going to they're gonna welcome FTMs that are players to Inferno. And so in 97, I went to to IML uh, with Tony, and he introduced me to a number of full members of the Chicago Hellfire Club. And Doug, when I tell you the difference in how they perceived me before he disclosed um, that I was FTM and, and after, it was, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. I mean, I was uh, 30, 33 years old. I was a personal trainer. Um, anybody that sees pictures of me in 1998, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm I, I was easy on the eyes. I was a top, so the initial and very attractive. And the and the the initial like was like oh great he's hot great. I had a, a one guy like take a look at my hands which are small, and ask me if I was into fisting. And then when he disclosed I was FTM, it was there was a, this mix of like horror, and hostility. And then with some of the guys that were a little bit better at hiding their feelings, it's like this this curtain would drop. And um, 1997 was the first year that Tony de Blas, the first and only time I believe that Tony did not go to Inferno because of the, the backlash and the response of the full members to, to his attempt to invite myself and other FTMs to the event. Tony was year. told you will not invite yeah. Billy to Inferno. Yeah. Who told him this? The club. The full members. We will not accept the invitation. You may not invite him. Removed. And he was very angry. He considered leaving the club. And he did not go to Inferno that year. And I remember that because I went. I wrote a letter in support. And uh, uh, I spoke to people and said there's no reason uh, why uh, men who have uh, transitioned can't come to men's events, including Inferno. And they didn't get it at all. And they were not happy. And Tony refused to go, and he considered leaving Hellfire over it. See, and I don't think Tony was terribly public about the fact that he wasn't going to Inferno. No, he wasn't. I think that uh, my, my impression of this was that Tony was incredibly disappointed and deeply hurt by this response. And, and other people that know Tony better than I did um, might know a little bit better like exactly what he was going through at that time. He was disappointed and, and that they felt the way they did and hurt, yeah. and he didn't want to be near them. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, and I know. You mentioned Tony being very hurt. What were your personal feelings? You know, I, um, I, I, was, I, was, I was surprised and I was hurt, and I mean, I, I've always been fairly, uh, fairly fortunate as far as like being able to move into spaces and, and gain acceptance. I certainly, um, when I moved to San Francisco in 88, I found the leather community, which welcomed me with open arms, yeah. and, and as I transitioned and moved to Seattle, the men of Seattle, um, with the exception of a, of, a, of a couple of assholes who shall remain nameless at this point in time, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the guys in Seattle were terrific. Um, I, I, I'd always, you know, kind of had a charmed life around that kind of, of And kind you're of very thing. resilient, Billy. But... Um, it, it hurt me too, and I didn't understand it. And but <laughs> so this is when Tony hatched the idea of me competing at IML. Okay. So Tony said, so Tony's idea was, well, we need to take this to a bigger stage. Like we need to expose more people to the idea of FTMs as part of the gay male community. Why don't you compete at IML? And um, Audrey Joseph uh, had always tried to get me to compete for. Um, San Francisco Ms. Leather in, uh, when I lived in San Francisco and I used to tell her uh, when hell freezes over I'll one, run for a title so uh, when I ran for Seattle <laughs> Mr. Leather as a as a as a as as my title to compete for before IML uh, she called me up and left me a message that it might must be colder in Seattle than um, than she had thought 
Because so, so yeah, so Tony and I talked about it. We agreed that I would compete at IML, um, and uh, tell them what the response from IML was. Oh, this was really so. Um, so after I won Seattle Mr. Letter, uh, Joe Bean, who I mentioned that I'd been friends with, who was living in Chicago at the time, because he was uh, running the Leather Archives and Museum. Yes. Um, uh, called me up and uh, and told me that he was going to, to talk to Chuck and this is this is legend you know as I know it although I've, I've come to understand that maybe I don't really understand everything that was going on but from what I understand Joseph called up Chuck and said there's this guy that just won a contest out in Seattle you know hot you know a letter guy um, and his history is is that he's uh, he's FTM and and, and Chuck didn't care as long as I presented his mail and had and had mail ID. So that okay. was that was kind of how how I understood that that came to pass. The quote I heard, yeah. but I didn't hear it from yeah. Chuck at yeah. second hand. Yeah, is uh, he asked does does this man have mail ID? Yeah, and was told yes. Yeah, and said well if the government accepts him as yeah. mails, I, yeah. there's no reason why. Yeah, see, you know, and some of that, that stuff may be is true or not. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and some of this is, you know, second and third hand, and, you know, it's a long time ago, too, so it's like, but I do remember talking to Joe that night that I won my contest, and Joe um, telling me that, that I was welcome to compete at IML. And you did compete, so it, that was the decision. So tell me a bit about competing at IML. How were you received among right. the other contestants, the so, organization? Uh, so, um, God, it was, uh, I was scared, but I think a lot of guys are scared when they compete for a wide variety of reasons. I wasn't really sure how I'd be received. I'd been to IML the previous year, and I'd been there in 92 when Lenny won. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have a lot of exposure to IML, and I, I was concerned that there may be, um, that I was kind of setting myself up for a bad experience. And I tell you what, from um, from the chief judge, Tom Dunkowski, who I met early on there and had a, a lifelong friendship until he <coughs> passed away, um, to the contestant handlers, um, I, I, I just and and the other contestants, I felt nothing but acceptance and and welcome, and I just I was basically just one of the guys for the for the weekend. I felt like there no, I didn't feel treated differently treated at all. Different. I didn't even have somebody come up to me and say, if you have any problems, please let us know. Were you the first FTM? to compete at IML? We don't know. I mean, that's the thing, is that, you know, is that, I mean, I got a message from somebody last night on Scruff who's like, I would have never known you were FTM. And I'm like, oh, well, you're looking at a picture of my face. How would you know? You know, so it's like, we don't know. We don't know if somebody was FTM and has competed before. We don't know. We have no idea. It was 13, there may 14 have been, years. There may yeah. have been FTMs at Inferno yeah. before before, you know, 92 or whatever, we don't know. There were we, intersex we members do, we of Hellfire, certainly. We, we do know that I was um, the first out FTM that competed in 98. There was a lot of discussion you, you, you depicted among a lot of the gay men, a lot of the players. Mm -hmm. As far as inclusivity with mm -hmm. Hellfire Club, mm -hmm. you went, you, you competed in IML. Mm -hmm. What continued on with Hellfire Club. Bring me to that. Tell me how that began to transpire. Well, I think that um, after I competed in 98, they, you know, the, the men that were interested in inclusion continued to have the conversations. Um, you know, I wasn't obviously a part of those because I'm, I was not a member of, of the Chicago Hellfire Club. I was not a part of those conversations. But the co conversations you know, continued continued to happen, and from what I understand, happened is is that there were there were some people that were open to inclusion. There were some people that wanted more education and more understanding, and then there were people that were completely opposed to any even discussions about including um, uh, FTMs at, at Chicago Hellfire Club events. Where did you find inclusivity? So yeah, so in '98, um, let's see, in the, I met Michael Horowitz at IMSL, I think in '95 and '96, whenever it was in Philadelphia, 
and he and I, the minute we met, uh, we instantly fell in love. We were um, very good friends, to this day very good friends. And in 98, uh, Michael invited me to another run, which had started in, uh, in 95, called Delta. And Delta was, um, there were a, there's a bunch of guys that were unhappy with, with, uh, with Inferno that, that created, created Delta, which is a, a basically a, another men's uh, play event. And it was uh, created by a lot of the guys from Inferno, so you can imagine that this is, that's still that high level of, of, of players. And so in, in uh, September of 1998, after competing at IML, I went to my first Delta International. And uh, I'm going to take my vest off right now because this I want to show. This is what I want to show wow. the, people, yeah. the people. Like, I have been at Delta every year since 1998. The, the brotherhood and the level of play that I experienced at Delta was absolutely beyond belief. The level of acceptance that I got um, was just, it was amazing. And I think that as a, as a young man at the time of 34, I was amazed to see men in their like 70s and 80s still playing and playing hard. And, uh, and it, it, it is very emotional for me because, you know, we do have a lot of ageism in our community as well. That's true. And, uh, and it was just so incredible for me to feel that acceptance, and I mean, I played so hard. I was exhausted after after the weekend. And you have been a, you have been a, an invaluable part of Delta well, uh, uh, since you joined. Well, I mean, from the chairman uh, Charlie Clark, who definitely made me feel welcome, um, uh, to Harold Cox, one of the guys that that, that started Delta. Um, you know, I mean, so many so many men uh, that were there my first year just so welcoming and making me feel sexy and that I belonged. It was really incredible. In other words, a sea, a sea change from the response from Hilton. Completely different than the response from Hilton. Why do you think it was so different? Um, I think that part of it was is that, uh, from what I understand, Michael Horowitz approached Harold Cox. And Harold Cox said, well, is he a player? And Michael's like, oh yeah, I've played with him. He's definitely a player. And, and he's hot, and he would he would he would fit in, and so basically the guys that were in charge of the club um, decided to to invite me and to welcome you too, and, and to welcome me, and and I had a great time. I played. I did a little bit more switching then. I was a little bit younger, so I did some bottoming, and I had a great time. Um, uh, and, it, and I and I topped. I had a really good time. But I think that you know I. I'm sure it's not just Harold, but I, I do know that Harold was a very, um, very vocal yeah. supporter of me being there. And even after, in in 99, it actually came <coughs> up at the general membership meeting during Delta, there were men that were unhappy that I was there. They thought that I should be thrown out of the club and that FTM should be banned. And Harold, among others, basically said, well, there's the fucking door. If wow. you don't like it, go. If you don't like it, you can go. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, they were very, very vocal. And there were men, uh, a small handful of men that actually left Delta <coughs> um, because, because I was welcome. Yeah. And, uh, and it, was, it was after what had happened with Inferno, it was a, a definitely a, a, a real difference. And, uh, and I mean, I, and I love my brothers at Delta. Yeah. And I love the organization because they they have been welcoming hmm. and, yes. and supportive and uh, and very in their own quiet Delta sort of way uh, they've been the community leaders in the men's play community around this they were the first outspoken club that said no we are going to welcome these men into our into our play spaces. Well, Seattle men would rather too. Uh, I don't know when Seattle Men in Leather actually did that. Well, they um, welcomed you, in other words. Well, they welcomed me. I don't know because I wasn't a part of Seattle Men in Leather, and I don't really know when all of that happened. And, of course, Dave Lewis uh, is not around anymore. Yeah. And Dave would probably, he would but be. This, whole, this yeah. whole time was a time where many more uh, uh, people were transitioning. And becoming visible, mm -hmm. and not being willing to hide anymore. Right. 
Well, and I mean, and the thing is, too, is that you have to remember is that, you know, having uh, gay, gay uh, men that were trans was still fairly new. I mean, Lou Sullivan was the first one. He was still alive when I transitioned back. Uh, he passed away in 91 or, nine, yeah, 91 maybe. Yeah. Um, and he was the first one that was allowed by the medical community. He, he fought to transition to being a man and being a gay man. So a lot of transgen uh, transgender people, transsexuals at the time, uh, the medical community would not support your transition if you weren't going to be straight. Uh, so if you were male to female, you were going to be with men. So there was, I mean, uh, there were uh, MTF people had their lesbians <laughs> when I was living in San Francisco, but it was still fairly new to have gay identified um, uh, transgender people or transsexuals, which was the common vernacular at the time. So this was still fairly new, and so what was happening is, is that now in the late 80s and early 90s, people were becoming aware of us, and clubs like, uh, like Delta and, and Seattle Men in Leather were starting to take uh, a stance, and then the internet started happening too. So mm -hmm. I think that the internet also started contributing to, uh, to the education that you know there were these people, and there were certainly people, thought leaders, within the gay community that were talking about this. And then there were the, the, the FTMs and the M2Fs themselves that were being out and saying, no, I'm not going to be closeted about my past. This is a part of my past. I'm not ashamed of it. Right. And I'm part and, of the men's community now yeah. and part of the leather yeah, men's exactly. community. Exactly. So it was, it was definitely starting to happen. And certainly my acceptance and my, uh, and my, my friendship with, <coughs> with Tom Domkowski but my acceptance at IML and my friendship with Tom Domkowski and then also my friendship with Michael Horowitz and, and his inviting me to Delta and then you know the men of Delta, um, specifically Harold Cox, being very vocal about his support of me being there uh, was really instrumental to me finding my way in the gay men's uh, leather community. Very instrumental. For, for those who do not know, would you please explain who Tom Domkowski, Michael Horowitz, and Harold Cox are? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with with Tom Domkowski. Um, Tom Domkowski, for many, many years uh, with IML, was the chief judge, and I met him the year that I competed. Um, he's a, I mean, Google Tom Domkowski, you're going to, he was a, just a prolific community activist within the Chicago, the Chicago scene, and just a wonderful man. An absolutely wonderful man, um, but he was involved with IML as their chief judge for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and I worked with him on his staff uh, before I became the judges coordinator for IML several years later. Um, Michael Horowitz, God, Michael's been around. How long? How long have you known Michael for? Uh, I've known Michael since my first inferno in 1984. So. Yeah. So Michael. He's been around since so then, Michael and, and particularly active in the New York community. So. Yeah. As an organizer of Folsom East and, and GMSMA. And GMSMA. And, yeah, so Michael Horowitz has been around the leather community, uh, specifically in New York and internationally through, uh, through the Chicago Hellfire Club um, as a player, uh, many years presenter, uh, does amazing mummification, electrical. So he's uh, you know very well known within the men's community and also within the, the, the women's community as well. He's a... Definitely. I mean, I met him at IMSL, where he was doing a presentation on mummification. So uh, in the in the mid '90s. Uh, yeah, and then you know, uh, in the late '90s and and you know, early uh, 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 2000 uh, is when I come into the story, because after what happened at Hellfire in '97, I think you went on to IML and and Delta, where you where you were welcomed. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you were put going it aside. To, you, you were going. You were going to. You were going to Delta though. I was going to Delta then, and I saw what was going and on. And what, it, uh, what other name did you ask about? There was another name that you wanted to know about. Harold Cox. Oh, Harold Cox. Yeah. So <coughs> Harold Cox is God. He's he was a fixture at Inferno. And from and the a, beginning. From the beginning, um, <coughs> amazing player. Um, some of you that are a little bit older or are a little bit luckier probably have been to the mountain. Which is Harold's Harold's place in in Wilkesbury, um, and his in his play space. Uh, but he's and he's just, still around. He uh, wrote he wrote Checkmate magazine. Yeah. Okay. So those of you that are uh, uh, I remember it. Yeah, 
I mean, amazing, amazing player, um, incredibly intelligent, uh, and and like Tony and Joseph and, and and Peter, definitely one of these people that is you know wasn't afraid. He wasn't a follower. He was a leader and said, okay, you know, here's the situation. What are we going to do? And what's right? Yeah. What is the right thing to do? What is the what's the appropriate thing to do very very thoughtful and, 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 then, a, and a very good friend a very good friend of mine and, and certainly a great advocate within Delta for uh, FTM men. Uh, the next thing that happened really was in the same year in 2002 uh, the 15 Association uh, we'd never had a policy and there had been uh, men who were uh, transitioned coming to our events regularly some of whom I invited uh, but in 2002, uh, somebody wrote into the uh, Bay Area Reporter a letter saying that the 15 uh, parties now included drag kings, was the expression they used for transgender uh, men. And uh, the 15, uh, the chairman, the board of directors, and I was on the board of directors, I was one of the full members, uh, voted to put it out to the membership. Uh, whether we would welcome transgender men. And that's the phrase we used, welcome. And we had 110 members, and I think about 80 of them responded. It was by email. And one person said no, one person said I'm not sure, but decided they were a yes. And, and 71 people said yes, we need to be welcoming. And then that same year, I don't know whether you came to me or I came to you, but I thought it was time to think about inviting you to Inferno again. Um, I don't remember exactly how it all went down, but I do remember... Because um, after the 15, I felt bad about what had happened five years earlier, and I knew about Delta and had seen Billy at Delta, knew about his competing, we were friends. Well, I think that part of what happened for me is that in 99, I came back to IML, as part of uh, Tom Domkowski's staff. So I, I worked with, with the judges, and so every year in May, I, it, would, it was like this, you can't come to CHC. You can't come to play events, and you walk around the vendor mart, and CHC has a table, and they invite everybody. But there, not you. But not me, to it the clubhouse. Like, yeah, yeah. So it was like, every year it was like this little, like, the nasty this little, needle this hitting. little, little yeah. poke. And then people would come up to me, guys that I didn't know, would come up to me and say, hey, are you going to the clubhouse tonight? It's like, no, I'm not allowed to go. So it was like every year it was like this little needle. Mm. And I would live in my little Delta bubble, in my little Seattle Mr. Leather bubble for most of the year. And then I'd go to Chicago and, and work for an organization that I love, IML, with people that I loved being <coughs> with. And, and once a year I'd get this... <coughs> And I, and I don't know if Peter contacted me. This is something that we're a little bit fuzzy on. We didn't really start, like, recording this stuff until probably 2005. Yeah. So our timeline of this stuff is, is a little fuzzy. But I don't know if Peter contacted me to tell me what was happening with the 15. Or, I think that might be it. I, yeah, I can't remember. But, but I'm not sure. But, yeah. In any case, I, I, I decided to invite Billy, and he agreed that he would accept an invitation. To, in, to Inferno. To Inferno. So he started it up again. And by now, um, it was like, it was many years later, and so, and I had, I was now, I think in 2002, I, I, I ran for the board and was, was elected to the board of Delta. And I, oh. served, I served two two consecutive three-year terms, which is a maximum, without stepping off the board. And my last year that I was, I was, I was vice chair for four years, and I was chairman for a year for Delta. Yeah. And, um, and the chairman of Delta was not allowed to attend any Hellfire event. Yeah, so it was, it, but it was just, so I think that in 2002, that between what was happening and Peter like, you know, just kind of feeling bad and me being needled every year, we decided that we, we were gonna, something we would do it. something about yeah. it. So, I, I have here in this timeline that you yeah, presented, yeah. from May 24th, 2007, Heather Kessel from the Bay Area Reporter published a story about CHC's discriminatory policy. Uh, that article created a shitstorm with people attacking Peter and myself, to which we say, if you don't like the truth, change it. Yeah. So, so... 
um, between 2002 and 2007, um, uh, CHC actually polled its members. They did a they did a survey of their members, at, which was um, I, I never saw the survey, so I don't really I know did. what it said. But the majority of the members were open to having FTMs as guests. Yes. But so it was but still, not as members. But the full members refused. Uh, the full members refused, and because it was a matter of great. Uh, 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 difficulty and there was anger on both sides. Yeah. Uh, they decided that they would, uh, 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 if you weren't born male, yep. and that's the word they used, yes, the words they born used, male. you could not attend. You could not attend. Uh, or join. Or join. And, uh, and there would be no further discussion of the matter for five years, and that was in 2006. So there were a few people that were unhappy with this new policy, and one of them, uh, uh, Volta, um, actually contacted Heather, and he's the one that Peter yes, reminded me is. of this earlier. Volta I was actually contacted. We were both accused of having done this story. And it wasn't us, it was Volta. So Volta I knew from, I, I met him at Delta, and he had gotten involved um, in 2002. Yeah. And he had he was a group of the part of the group of guys that were trying to get the policy changed from CHC, and was a was a was a great advocate at the time. Yeah. And incredibly intelligent, great player, very well known, and uh, so he <laughs> he decided that he would contact Heather and let her know that this club that supposedly was like I think that. The CHC was uh, trying to say that they promoted uh, trans inclusion in the city of Chicago. Yes, that, that was they what were was for happening. the ordinance. Yeah. yeah, they were for the oh. ordinance in 2007. <laughs> really? Yeah, and they so also that, were saying they were leaders in the community. And, uh, but yeah. leaders in the community were discriminating but, against but part that of the was, community. That's exa I think that's what it was. I, I'd have to go back to Volta, but I'm pretty sure that what was happening in 2007, and that's what stuck in, in Volta's craw, was that they were saying that they were supporting this trans inclusion policy, and he's like, you friggin' hypocrites. You don't allow trans guys in your club. And he contacted Heather from the BAR. And they had just voted to not even discuss it for five years. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Which was why he contacted her. Yep. So, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So, now it was five years later in 2007. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, so Heather contacted me. To, to get my thoughts, and, and it was, uh, it, she's, she's a great writer and very thoughtful. She did a lot of, um, a lot of uh, research before she talked to me. She talked to some other people within San Francisco at the time. She talked to me, and I confirmed pretty much what people yep. had said, but I said, you can't quote me. Yeah, so, um, but, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was really great. I thought that it, uh, I thought it was an excellent article, but, the guys at CHC were furious. They were livid that their they name were, had been mentioned in, in the gay press, particularly in such a context. Okay. In such a context, and they were absolutely furious. And um, so IML was a little more fun for me that year. And we had to explain to them that, yes, you have a right to have any policies you want. And, and so, and so. But the public has a right to know. So, yeah. you know, that's always when people ask me, you know, well, it's like, well, it's a private club. My feeling is, is that if you are asking the leather community for money, for support. You want to wear a back patch and parade around the community. If you want to do that, then you are opening yourself up to a critique by a member of the community. And I am a member of the community, and I have the right to express my displeasure around your policy. You have a right to have your policy if you want to be an organization, but I have a right to express my displeasure and also say what I think. And the community has a right to know. In the in the community, and otherwise they may support an event that they really yeah. totally which, wouldn't. Which, which is knew. what which right. is what happened to Peter around International Leather Sir. They did not tell them that they had an anti-trans policy. 
And they got me to judge. And they got him to judge, and I called him up. And I wouldn't after, have done it. I called him up afterwards, and I said, I said, you know, that really hurt my feelings that you judged the contest. He said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, you don't know? They have an anti-trans policy. And he says, they do not. And I said, yeah, it's not on their website, but they definitely do. It's on Yeah, because I had checked their website, and they literally lied to me and told me that they that they accepted transgender men, that all males could compete. Yeah. So, and I and knew, were welcome. And I knew from talking to people that had filled out applications is that it was on the written application that they excluded trans men. So, so my feeling is is that if you want to have a have a policy against a certain group of people, then then you need to be open about it, or you can have your own little private club with your six friends in your yeah. basement. Yeah. <coughs> you know? and, and and in two thousand six, uh, with Leather Sir, the event <coughs> in San Francisco directly violated the the. Uh, uh, Equal uh, uh, equal rights in San Francisco, the law. Oh, I see. They had an event where transgender men were not allowed to compete. Yep. In a public space, mm -hmm. they certainly violated the law. Yeah. And uh, in actual fact, uh, the the event went ahead, but they didn't have another one. Yeah. The public uh, was not. Well, and you can read that in, in Heather's article in the BAR is a, about the backlash. Um, there was a terrible backlash. I mean, I had someone who is a leader in the community to this day, and I won't name that person, but that person who is of color actually said to me, why would transgender men go where they're not wanted? Why don't they start their own events for transgender men? And I said, oh, so Rosa Parks should have gotten off the bus because the white people didn't like her and didn't want her there? What are these folks supposed to do? Are you listening to yourself? And I said, and by the way, you have friends and close people to you who are transgender men and who are being excluded. You need to rethink this. And it took about two weeks, and I got a call back saying, I've thought about it, you're right. But publicly, no support. Yeah, uh, in, in Mr. Marcus from BAR actually wrote, what kind of leader in the community is it who washes the community's dirty linen in public in the newspaper? Of all I, people. I, I, well, and I, specifically I, saying my name. Well, I think that he was pissed off because Heather wrote this <coughs> article about the leather community. And he was he, livid. He screamed at her. Yeah, he, he screamed at her. He was very upset. He screamed at Cynthia. How dare you print this? And Cynthia said the BAR is a newspaper for everyone. Yeah. And, you're, and you're a columnist. Yeah. yeah. But circumstances began to change. What happened with ILSB in the fall of 2007? Oh, well, uh, Mark Frazier. Yes. Uh, Mark Frazier, Love actually. You, Mark. <laughs> yeah, Mark Frazier, who, had, who um, was, uh, you know, uh, uh, was, I met Mark Frazier actually through Tony de Blas. Yeah. Um, and Mark had always been an ally in this fight. Um, Mark and he Frazier, owned the Dallas Eagle. And yeah, yeah and you know, a, a very well-known uh, businessman and community leader and presenter within our within our community, um, actually bought I, ILSB, and um, and he changed the policy as soon as he bought it. I sent him an email and I said, Mark, we really want you to change this policy, and he said that what was holding him up was a clause that that that, uh, that Mike Zool had in it that Mike did not want Mark to change the policy. Um, and, and Mike had started this this uh, rumor, and it is a rumor that uh, Leather Sir and Boy, which was based on Drummer, that Drummer had not allowed transgender uh, men to compete as Drummer or Drummer Boy, and it was completely untrue. Well, and, and it, you, you have to kind of go back to what we had talked about. You know, the 15 had no policy. A lot of the men's clubs had no policy before, you know, before this became an issue. And Drummer had no policy. Yeah. I lived in San Francisco. There was no policy. But there were also not any out FTMs that were trying to compete. Yeah. And so I think the only time that this actually really came up with regard to Drummer was in 1998. There was a, a drummer boy, Eric, who was told, told by Robert Duvall, and I'm friends with Eric, and, and, I, and I trust him when he told me this, is that Robert said that he could compete, but that he would not win. Hmm. Because he was 
trans. And he wasn't to tell people. And that he wasn't to tell people. Yes, he was told and, he wasn't and, to and, tell and, people. And, 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 and cover I, up, by the way. And, well, no, and, well, I tell wow. you what, I've been in bathhouses with this guy, and uh, I don't think a lot of people knew that he was trans anyway, but I, I, I digress. But, so, you know, in my understanding of drummer, there was no, there was never a policy except for Robert telling Eric that. Yeah. And I don't think and that was, wasn't policy. And I don't, I don't think that it was ever policy. It certainly, I mean, wasn't any policy. But that, that was I the did. start of change because Leather Sir and Boy publicly announced that uh, all men could compete. Yep. They wouldn't ask whether you're, what your birth status was. Yeah. So, so now we were starting to get this critical mass. We had Delta International, which was open. We had the 15, which not only was open, but was welcoming and... And, and which refused to support other clubs that no, they did actually, not allow they, their they members. No, they actually, you know, and there was a lot of overlap at the time between 15 and CHC, and there still is, but... And between the, Delta and, and CHC. But they, the, the 15 told CHC that as long as all of their members were not welcome at CHC events that they could not support them financially and that their wow. colors could the not 15, be displayed. The 15 colors would not be displayed at any CHC events until they changed their policy so that all of their members, all of the 15 members, were included. So it was, uh, it was quite something. And so that happened in 2002. And in 2007, uh, Mark Frazier bought International Leather Sir and, and, and was very public about changing the policy. And all this time, more and more uh, men who were trans were coming out they and were, were saying, I won't hide anymore. Yeah, they were, and more and more allies were saying, it's wrong to exclude. Yeah, I mean... And people were starting to speak up. Well, and, and you know, to, to that point, when, um, when we were talking, talking about International Leather Sir in 2006, um, and those of you that are part of the Yahoo Leather Title Holders page can go back and read these these postings. I, I did recently, so they're still there. Um, and uh, the only person that stood up for Peter publicly, and for, for me publicly back in 2006, was Phil Nickerson. Yes. Phil Nickerson was lives the in old, Iowa, and who still lives in to Iowa. Him. Wonderful Phil <coughs> is the only one that I, and he got so angry and so irate and said, you know, how dare you? These are these men are part of our community, and and it, it was it was quite wonderful to see this. But you know, this was. But it also caused people to rethink it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it caused people to say, well, maybe I've got this wrong. Maybe it's maybe there's there's a, maybe we need to be open. Maybe we need to let these guys come. Well, and, and, and the other thing that was true, too, is you weren't talking about three or four guys like you were talking about in the late 80s and early 90s. You were talking about a lot of people. You were talking about out title holders, um, American uh, Leather Boy. What, what year did Tyler Fong win? Uh, Tyler won, I think, in 2009. Nine or ten. Nine or ten. And then Tyler McCormick won. And then Tyler McCormick won IML. That made, that made so, an ten. enormous so, difference. So, so what was happening from like 92 to 2003, 2006, 2007, is that there were more and more FTMs that were out that were playing. Certainly the guys at the 15 were being exposed to FTMs. The guys at Seattle and the Leather were being exposed to FTMs. Um, and not only exposed, they were becoming me full members, voting members, mm -hmm. officers. Yep, becoming uh, uh, Tyler. Same thing at Delta. Same thing at Delta. And so um, so the, the clubs that had played were becoming inclusive. And then the greater Leather community, our title holders, the organizations were becoming more inclusive and, and saying, no, the, these men are welcome. And uh, when Mark Frazier changed International Leather Sir, now our two big title holder organizations were inclusive. And, and, and the only real clubs that were not inclusive uh, and including and welcoming were Hellfire and Discipline Corps. And, and, and maybe and some other... most of the others had, had accepted. And maybe, and, and maybe some small, small clubs that you, you really are six guys that play together. In but it, yeah. it, it was yeah. about that yeah. time, Billy, that the two of us realized that what had started out with Hellfire uh, was much bigger than that. It was now the whole community. And that it was a matter of setting community standards. Were transgender men welcome or were they not? 
Were they to be included or excluded? Uh, and it was a, had to be a community discussion, and a community standard needed to be set either way, and that that was going to be more of a struggle. But coming pointedly yeah. to Tyler McCormick's win at IML mm -hmm. in 2010, yeah. share your, your thoughts on it, your feelings. Well, it's really interesting. I, I, because, I was, because I competed out in 98, um, and because I've stayed involved with IML is over the years when um, when transgender men want to compete at IML, I invariably in in I love the the age of Facebook. I in, invariably get a message on Facebook from somebody that I don't know that says, "Hi, I'm Mr. So and So Letter from blah blah blah, and I'm going <coughs> to be competing at IML. Can I talk to you?" And um, and so that's actually how I met Tyler. And you know what's coming. And that's how I met Tyler. And Tyler reached out to me, and, and we had a chat. And, and I said, look, I said, here's, here's my recommendation. And there had been other F2Ms competing at IML, some out, some not out, since I competed in 98. So he wasn't certainly the next after me. Um, and, and I just I said, look, I said, you know, you can choose to be out. You can choose not to be out. I said, my recommendation is be yourself and, and have a good time and know that IML supports you being there and I support you being there. And, uh, and he showed up and, and he had a great time. I mean, you know, you work with the contestants, you know, it's like there's some guys that are just there, they're having fun. That's right. They're really... And he was a wonderful com uh, competitor. But, you know, you know, it was like... Brave and sweet and, 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 and I attractive didn't really, I didn't, I, and real. And I didn't really, I didn't really know until, I mean, his state, his... His speech was really uh, was really quite moving. Um, for many of you that that, that don't know, uh, uh, Tyler can walk, but it's easier for him to get around in a wheelchair. Um, and uh, he can and walk he, a short distance. He can walk, and he walks. Tyler McCormick. McCormick yes. exactly. Tyler McCormick, and he came out and walked out to the microphone and did his speech, and then walked out. But I still think that what really like made me realize that he was like who he was was when he came out to do his physique portion he was in his wheelchair and he got up towards the end of it and he shook his ass at the judges lifted his ass out of his wheelchair and shook his ass at the judges and it's like it's easy it's this it's this embracing of your masculinity and loving yourself and and feeling good and putting yourself out there that to me was like he did. He put himself out there, and and I really believe that that's why the judges in the end chose yeah. him to be. And he did say he was. He did say he was uh, a man living with disability, and he did say that he was a man who was transgender. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He did in his speech, and, and, and but in a matter of fact way. Right. So it was, um, I, you know, and I don't remember his his exact wording, but the thing is, is that. Um, is that is that he won, and uh, and what was also really interesting was that there was a an, an incredible backlash. Like I can't believe, like, with us. like I like I can't believe that IML picked this person. You know, this person's really a woman. It was horrible. But you know what was really cool is you know who 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 responded to the community that was attacking him. The community, yeah. the community responded, and it wasn't one Phil Nickerson. It, yeah, was it was a, whole a lot of people yeah. in 2010, yeah. and Tyler barely spoke about it. Yes, that's true. He barely spoke about it. It was the community, and so it's like you see this, like, you know, these few people back in 92 talking about this, and then one man doing this thing in 97, and then me coming on board, and, and, and then you see, like, one person or a couple of people, Volta and Peter and Phil Nickerson. Each and, person who and comes out brings more people who come out. Exactly. Each ally brings and, more out. And, and brings more more people. And so when, when Tyler won, and and there were definitely people that were unhappy about him winning. There were a lot of misogynistic, transphobic comments about him. He, um, and he, he learned to joke about it. He, he even referred to himself, and uh, don't be offended by this language, he referred to himself as a tranny in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. So, but 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 you know, but the the community was changing, and and the fact that they that the judges selected 
um, a transgender man. And he won fair and square. I was there. Well, I mean, you know. I believe that too. You know, and and it was it was incredible. He had an incredible year, and uh, and I'm so He's proud. Highly respected. I'm so proud, I'm of, proud him. of him. And uh, and it's and and every year now, it, it just for me is so interesting, and 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 to see the. To see the community change, and to see the community accept FTMs as part of the male title holder community, and to see men accepted within the gay male play spaces was really just just watching that, and then you know going through and taking the time to like write down things as they were happening was really it was amazing. And then um, I think the next thing that happened was uh, Mark Fraser sold International Leather Sir. To, to Jeffrey Payne. In October of 2011, the, the CHC, Chicago Hellfire Club, reorganized. Yeah. Um, and that created considerable changes. Tell me about that. Tell us about that. Yeah, this was really, actually, really exciting because um, one, of the, one, of our, one of our allies within the club had, had told us, and I'd heard this from a, a number of guys that were members of CHC, that the the way that the club was organized, it was basically hamstrung from changing. The full members um, really weren't letting the club move forward, and it wasn't until the club reorganized and changed the way that it was organized that I think that the club really was ready to to move past it. I mean, the, the full members would fight with each other, and, and they had a, 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 an issue around the transgender. And all sorts of other and issues and as other, well. Other issues, and, and so there wasn't really an opportunity to change, but in October of 2011, the club reorganized, and um, instead of having full members that were brought in by other full members, the membership opened up. If you lived within, I think, the city limits of Chicago, or oh, 50, within 50 miles, within 50 miles, you had, you had to short, be a full member had, or nothing. You either had to be a full member or nothing. And before that, you'd had the the full members and then the associate members. And so now, you had 50 or 60 people that were full members, and the and full a, members and were and the a, only ones with an elected the board of directors. Yeah. And an elected board of directors, not a self-selected group of 16 or 17 or 18, but an elected board of directors. And much to my delight, uh, somebody that I knew was an ally, uh, Paul Cantrell, yeah. was the first president of Chicago Hellfire Club. Under that system. Under that system. And one of the first things that Paul did was Paul actually had the guest policy changed. To include FTMs, and he wanted to change the policy entirely. Yep, but he couldn't find enough support at that yep. time. So, so it was a baby step. It was um, guests. FTMs could be guests. And the most interesting thing about that, <laughs> they, 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 they hid were it. afraid to tell us. They wouldn't tell they us. They hid it from everyone. <laughs> yeah, they didn't did. make they any did. announcement. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard rumors. Yeah, we heard You're rumors. going to be disappointed. You think you won. You think they've opened up. But it isn't true. Wow. So, <laughs> and finally, a friend of mine in San Francisco who's with the 15, and who's very active in Hellfire, yeah. uh, said to me, I need to tell you the truth. Yeah. And membership is still closed, and it will be for five years. So, so yeah, so. And I was livid. <laughs> more that they hadn't told us yeah. than anything else. So it was a. Uh, so it was and I said, "Fine, we'll continue this till it's over." Yeah, but you know, even though they changed it, when they changed the way that they were that they were set up, there were still people that were incredibly unhappy about about this. They did not want FTMs at the, at the club. No. And um, they wanted the clubhouse sanitized if any if any transgender man had been there or yeah. any woman. Yeah. So. I mean, but that's not the whole club. That's a few people. There was a few people. Hellfire, um, uh, they're my brothers. They're my family. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to quote John Krongard here because it's a very funny quote. Mm -hmm. I said to John once during this period, uh, I think about 08, well, I may not be a member anymore because, you know, I'm the first honorary member of Hellfire who ever resigned and the only and I said to John, well, I may not be a member anymore, but I'm still family. And he said, well, yeah, you're the old aunt we have to lock up in the attic. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy old aunt we yeah, John, up. John had the, had the dubious honor of, of being uh, uh, chairman among the full members, well, 
during part of the period where this was all going on. So And it was difficult for John. It was difficult. But like the club, he came around. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that I think that there were a lot of people that had personal feelings and then there were people that had political feelings and there were people that, you know, that like a lot of people who just wanted it all to go away. Well, and there were a lot of people that really believed that it's a private club and they should be able to do whatever they oh, want. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said before, I disagree with that. You want to wear public colors and you want to walk up to people at the vendor bar at IML and invite everybody. But to it your wasn't party. so much pressure on them as seeing they find if they finally got it that the right. clubs and right. events that were open were doing much better. Yeah. Uh, in attendance, in in excitement, in in public approval than they were, and they were known. To discriminate because we to we talked about it, and, and that's and the, the community thing. talked about. And that's it. the thing that, that I would that I would say to people is that, you know, that it, there's there's a difference between being an asshole and talking about something and, and informing people, and uh, and I feel like it's important for people to understand what people's policies are. If you want to have a policy, whether you're uh, you want you have a club or you have a, a I never contest told anyone they like shouldn't that. go to Inferno or shouldn't go to Hellfire events or shouldn't be a member of Hellfire, but I did tell people you need to know what their policies are. Right. It's a matter of understanding. But yeah. in in 2013, um, ILSB had a major change. Tell me what went on with that. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well. Um, I don't really know exactly how no, it went we down. Don't. There's 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 what people say. We know the response. We know what the response. Uh, so in 2013, uh, there was an announcement from ILSB, uh, ILSB, 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 that they were going to revert to their roots of drummer, which we've already talked about. Yes. Um, and once again, you'd have to be born male to compete. For sir and boy. Although transgender men would and women oh, yeah. would be welcome at their events. Uh, uh, welcome at their events and allowed to compete at, as community boot camp. Yeah. But not for sir and boy. And the community response was furious. The community response was, it blew us away. Yeah, it did. Peter and I didn't comment. Yeah. Neither one of us commented. We just watched. We just watched the fur fly, and it, it was and it was, it was, it was like, literally thousands of, and of Facebook messages and, and oh my emails. Every everything blew up. Oh my God! It was like and they called it. They announced that they had called another meeting to, was, to review this yeah. within three or four days. It and was, the meeting took place, and they said and, we and, made a mistake. In, in less than a week, in less than a week, they changed. They they decided that they'd made a mistake and that they were operating under some mis misperceptions or the community didn't understand it. <coughs> yeah. well, there was even yeah. four there days. Was even four talk days. that they yeah. had they had not intended to change the policy, only to have a discussion of it, yeah. but that it had been mistakenly released. But the, the, Who knows? the but the backlash from the community towards <coughs> the organization was was fierce. And uh, and it was just it made me feel so good because there were people that um, that had been around in 2006 and 2007 that who had felt totally differently or hadn't responded or people back in 2002 that hadn't 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 participated in any way and uh, and it was just for me great to see like some of my 15 club brothers because by then I had joined the 15 um, and uh, and to see some some of the young uh, trans men and other trans allies speaking up because by now Peter was not the only advocate, the other only vocal advocate. Oh no! There were a lot. There were the, men. The, a community there were, there standard were, there, had been established, yeah. basically. So there were cisgender men and women and other trans trans people, and and now of course we have uh, people that are um, non-binary. There were a lot of people within the community that responded in 2013, and the change, the reversion of like, oh yeah, we made a mistake. Yeah, we're not going to have that rule. Was uh, was incredible. and even kind of we're sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so it was a really it was a, it was quite fascinating and Pe Peter that's when we knew it was only a matter of time to uh, full acceptance to every club in the country being welcoming and and I tell you and, what and not just as as guests and I, and I tell you what and and so what ended up happening is you know I was talking about that little stick of you know being poked mm -hmm. every year in May um, I would talk to the full members of of Hellfire Club 
you know, which was now much bigger, and I would talk to the people that were on the board, and I would again like say, hey, when are you guys going to fix? When are you guys going to join the community, which has which now welcomes and accepts FTMs as part of the gay male community? When are you going to change? When are you going to catch up? Right. And uh, you know, and yeah, you want to be. You say you're leaders. You guys of the say you're leaders. Why aren't you you guys, catch up? you guys are behind the times. Yeah. All of the clubs, except for yours and Discipline Corps in Dallas, which cited CHC for the reason for their policy, yeah. um, they were they were now not a part of the community standard. And two years ago, in in 2015, uh, a gentleman from the 15, who was known to be transgender man. Yeah, he was openly uh, transgender. Yeah, was refused at Discipline Corps, and he decided he wanted to speak about it, yeah. and uh, I, I, I have to express my admiration for particularly Ramey and Pierre, because I went to Ramey and who was IML, maybe it was 2014, mm -hmm. uh, whatever his year was, and I went to Ramey and, and said, this is going to blow up and, and I need your support. Yeah. And, and uh, he didn't question it. He wanted to talk for a few minutes, and then he expressed full support. And everybody from IML came out of the woodwork. Contestants, IML uh, uh, volunteers, IML staff, uh, everyone. And everyone from the clubs, from Delta, from the 15, uh, rose up and said, this is wrong, and we're not going to we're not gonna support this club and, and their events until they change. And I had gone to them before that and tried to work things out, mm -hmm. just like I'd gone to Hellfire. Before I quit as a member, I tried to work with the committee that they had to decide what policy to have. And they decided that they would allow intersex uh, members and guests. They, already they would had not allow sex members. members or guests to be uh, 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 transgender. That's why they allowed intersex members, is because they already had intersex members and they didn't want to exclude. And after almost two years of that, one night, and this is a wonderful story, I went to bed and I was trying to decide whether to stay as a member or whether to quit. And I uh, said a little prayer to Tony de Blas's spirit. And I said, Tony, I need help. I need to know what to do. And I was really struggling. And he came to me as clearly as you guys here. And he said, do what's right and no regrets. And the next morning I phoned in and told him I was resigning and I sent a letter and sent back my, uh, uh, my colors. It broke my heart, but it had to be done. Where is the situation today with oh. CHC or any other organization? Well, um, it, this, this summer, I, I, I'm still friends with uh, a, a number of guys, Michael Horowitz and, and, um, and John E. out of New York. And um, this summer at a barbecue, I, w it was, I, was, I was asked if I would be willing to talk with somebody at CHC about their policy. This past summer. This past summer. So 16. And, yeah. yeah, 16. Okay. And so I was, I was, I was like, and when, when, uh, when I heard who was going to be contacting me, I was like thinking, oh yeah, that'll Loading. happen. Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, much to my surprise and delight, I got a very nice email from uh, one of the guys that was uh, part of the uh, of this committee, and he wanted he he said we're exploring changing our bylaws, and I want to talk with you about some wording around changing our bylaws for membership. And uh, I sent him an email back. I was very excited, and I talked with um, with Riley Johnson um, out of out of Chicago, and he had also um, been. I mean, he'd been attending uh, Hellfire events, his FTM, so he couldn't join, but he'd been attending events, and he had also been been contacted about the wording around this. And uh, I, I, you know, by now this has been 19 years for me. And uh, so I didn't really, I didn't want to get my hopes up, <laughs> but I was really excited um, that it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is going to be it. Maybe, you know, maybe they're going to do this. And, um, and so, uh, and then Riley, we heard it had been put on the agenda and then, and for, then, the, and, for and, the and Riley, and Riley went to, went, Inferno. went, went to Inferno yeah. um, this year. This was his first Inferno. He'd been around the club for a long time. 
uh, um, had been a, had been done programs for had, them. He was well programs. known. He was well known, um, and uh, so the he went to Inferno, the, yeah. and they they actually voted to change their membership policy. And, and it had to come to a vote, not just to the board, but the full yeah. members in Chicago had to vote on it. And, and it needed a two-thirds majority, and it actually got well over 75%. No, it was, no it, was, it was unanimous with one abstention. That's right. It was wow. unanimous. Wow. So this was yeah. unanimous with yeah. one abstention. And, uh, and <coughs> that's and, true. Just like the fifteen, it was unanimous with one extension. With one abstention. With one abstention. So they changed. Okay. Yeah, was, I'm proud and, of. Uh, and, and, Wonderful. And, yeah. So it was. Uh, it's. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of come full circle. And the very okay. next day, uh, they voted on Saturday. The very next day was the uh, general meeting of the discipline board in Dallas. And they changed. Their and policy they changed too. their policy. Same weekend. The same weekend. Same ah. weekend. <laughs> But there's a lot of overlap in the player community, so I'm sure that there was probably some conversations. And I think if you talk to uh, men who are transgender in the leather community and who go to play events or go to events, mm -hmm. that you will find that uh, that this standard that the community has decided upon of, of it just accepting people as, as men mm -hmm. uh, is playing out well. Don't you think, Billy? Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and you, we were talking a little bit about this. I think that things are, you know, uh, certainly uh, non-binary people. That, that adds another level of, like, of, of complexity to this situation. But, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of, of my advocates like Peter. Uh, when, I, when I think and of I'm an very advocate. I'm proud of your courage. But when I think of an advocate, to me, Peter Fisk is an advocate. He, um, he put a, a lifelong friendship with, with men in this club. He basically put that aside and said, this is not right. And, and the men that, that spoke up over the years, um, uh, Harold Cox, uh, Michael Horowitz, folks, yeah. uh, Volta, um, Roadkill from San Diego. I mean, I could go on and on. There are a lot of men that, that spoke up, and people like Tony de Blas, who, who, who had this idea, you know, and, and Joe Bean. Um, and, it's, and it's about realizing that our community does change and that the tent needs to be bigger. You know, it really does. And uh, so, if you go uh, uh, to events or join clubs in the men's leather BDSM community uh, now, today, 2017, uh, I think you will find broad acceptance. And people don't get asked, you know, what are you transgender? You know, people are yeah. people are not asked about their their birth status or their or their transition. That's private medical information. And that's been accepted now. And I might add to some people who, uh, and, and maybe Billy should be saying this rather than me as an ally, but I've seen too much hurt over it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people out someone who's transgender. Don't do it, folks. It, even in good circumstances, leave people their privacy. Thank you, gentlemen. It's yeah. been amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you uh, giving us this opportunity because uh, it's been a long journey. For us, it was a long struggle, and it, because it involved the whole community, yeah. it certainly came to the right conclusion, but it was a difficult time. Sure it was. Yeah. Well, you know. And history will thank you for it. Yeah. 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 When I see young guys who are transit out in the community, it just makes me happy. It makes me happy. Yeah. It totally they don't have to me. say a word. I don't even want them to. I just want them to. Have a good time. Participate and be Have in the fun. community. And, yeah. and it is so good for our community that we opened up. It is. It's very good. Now if we could just fix some other issues like <laughs> like racism and, and, well, and, and, that's and another income animal. inequality. But we'll talk about that another time. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. My God.